Once again, we welcome you to today's webinar. This is Self-Assembled Monolayers. This webinar is brought to you by NAC Network, established at the Pennsylvania State College of Engineering and funded in part by a grant from the National Science Foundation. I'm your host, Roxanne Montoya. And as your moderator today, we have Sam Ad Adagasi, or Adagasi, I'm so sorry. And your presenter today is Christina Aricio. Christina has worked as an assistant professor at Ivy Tech Community College of Indiana, South Bend campus, and she's currently finishing up her PhD in chemistry. Welcome, Christina. I wanted to ask you, how did you first become interested in self-assembled monolayers? Um, I first became interested in SAMS when I joined uh, the chemistry program at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, prior to actually signing on to the PhD program, I had met with Dr. Maria Lieberman and had a discussion about her research. And what I really liked about the monolayers is that uh, they have a lot of applications as biosensors. In particular, I was interested in disease detection. Uh, so a lot of our current testing methods involve patients having to go to a doctor, get a blood work order, go to a blood lab, get it drawn, go back to the doctor. And I was really interested in trying to make sensing devices that could sort of shorten that process and help make life easier for people. Um, so with that, let's actually move forward into our presentation. So I would like to say a hello to everyone. Thank you for joining me this afternoon. I'm going to talk about self-assembled monolayers, but that is actually a very broad uh, class of surface science. I'm going to particularly talk about using silane SAMs for bio-related applications. And I'm going to go over monolayer deposition, characterization, and some examples of bio applications. So first things first, what is a self-assembled monolayer? Basically, a monolayer is an arrangement of molecules that's a single layer thick on a surface. And it's highly ordered and highly oriented. Uh, the molecules are going to have either a chemical or physical attraction to the surface. And they orient themselves spontaneously and independently. So in most cases, the surface attraction stems from the fact that the molecules have a head group that has a high affinity for the surface. Now when it comes to silanes, they have a high affinity for oxide surfaces. And there's an actual chemical reaction that takes place. So there are a wide variety of well-known surface molecules and combinations. But I focused in on this silane chemistry. And what happens is the, the surfaces that have a native oxide, the silane is going to form a stable siloxane bond. This is a silicon oxygen bond. And that's between the silicon head group on the SAM and the oxide surface. And this bond is actually very stable. And it's very strong. So a lot of my work involves using either silicon surfaces or gallium nitride, which is a type of 3,5 semiconductor surface. So I actually had a lot of SAMs on GAN. And if anyone's a fan of Dr. Seuss and you know the book Green Eggs and Ham, you can imagine I've had a lot of jokes over the years about SAM on GAN. <laughs> <coughs> now, the benefit of functionalizing semiconductors is that they can easily be incorporated into electronic devices for biosensor applications. So the monolayers are going to serve as a molecular glue that provides an interface between hard technology and soft biology. <coughs> so I want to talk by so I want to start by talking about <coughs> two silanes in particular that I use. There's octadecyl trichloroxylane or OTS. <coughs> Forgive me, I'm getting over a cold. Um, OTS 
that's the molecule you see here on the left. This is a long 18 carbon chain molecule that's terminated in the silane group. And it is very hydrophobic. So OTS monolayers are useful for things like reducing adhesion. They're also useful for things like repelling bacteria. <coughs> On the right side, we have an aptus monolayer. That's aminopropyl triethoxysilane. Aptus is actually a short carbon chain, but on the tail end, it's terminated in an amine group. And this amine group is actually very useful because we can do additional chemistries on it. And this widens the usage of the monolayer. Now, as I go through this presentation, you will hear me talk about some different surface techniques. In particular, I'm going to talk about water contact angle, AFM, and XPS. <coughs> contact angle is actually a very simple technique, but it's a very powerful technique when dealing with monolayers. And this is because the monolayer is usually going to cause a significant change in hydrophobicity of your surface. So these oxide surface that I'm work surfaces that I'm working with, they all start out very hydrophilic or water loving. And then after monolayers have been deposited, they become hydrophobic or water fearing. So what you do in water contact angle is you put a droplet of water on a surface and you measure the angle that's formed at the liquid solid interface. Hydrophilic surfaces are going to cause the water droplet to spread out on the surface, and they will have contact angles of less than 90 degrees. A hydrophobic surface, the water is going to beat up, and this will cause a contact angle of greater than 90 degrees. Now, atomic force microscopy, or AFM, this is a non-optical imaging technique, and it's kind of like nanoscale braille. You use a very sharp tip that's going to feel the surface rather than see it. And the tip has an end radius of about 10 nanometers, which we bring really, really close to the surface. And at close distances, intermolecular forces, like attractive van der Waals forces or, repulsive or polyrepulsion forces, are going to cause that tip to either be pushed or pulled towards the surface. The tip is attached to a flexible cantilever, so as the tip gets pushed or pulled, the cantilever flexes up and down, back and forth, or bends back and forth. And we shine a laser light on the back of that cantilever, which gets reflected up to a position sensitive photo detector. And as the cantilever flexes, the position of the laser on the detector is going to change. <coughs> what you get out of all of this is a topographical image. It's going to give you a height data point for each XY data point. So it's a two-dimensional image that's giving you three-dimensional data. I always compare it to those maps of the United States where the mountains are one color and the flat plains are another color. That's a topography image. Finally, there's X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, or XPS. This is a quantitative elemental analysis technique. It's going to tell you what elements are present in your surface and in what concentrations. For this technique, what you do is you irradiate a surface with a beam of X-rays that are going to knock electrons out of the surface. And the electrons are going to come out with a distinct kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is actually equal to the energy of the X-ray minus the binding energy for the orbital that the electron came out of. So again, that's a quantitative, uh, quantitative elemental analysis technique but it's only sensitive for about the top few nanometers of a surface, like 5 to 10 nanometers. So it's a surface analysis technique. Now, before we can deposit a self-assembled monolayer on your surface, you have to make sure that the surface has been properly prepared, which for my semiconductor samples involves a very rigorous cleaning procedure. You want your surface to be as clean as possible so that you form a dense, high coverage monolayer. 
If you have dirt on your surface, that can either get in the way of the monolayer forming, or it can actually cause unfavored, uh, cause reverse attraction, if you will, of the monolayer to the surface. It can repel the monolayer. So you need things to be very clean. Uh, for this cleaning procedure, I typically do, you know, your classic triple solvent rinse where you have acetone, isopropanol, followed by ultra pure, high resistivity water. And then that's usually followed by what we call a piranha etch. And piranha is very interesting stuff. It's a mixture of concentrated sulfuric acid and hydrogen peroxide. And just as the name suggests, it eats away at a lot of organic residues, just like a piranha would eat away at things. So this is an AFM image of gallium nitride after it's gone through this rigorous cleaning procedure. Now in terms of contact angle, before the cleaning procedure, GAN is about mm, 35 to 40 degrees. Once you've gone through the cleaning procedure, however, that contact angle drops to below 10 degrees. It's actually very difficult to measure. So this is a very clean, very hydrophilic surface. Now this is a 1 micron squared AFM image that you're looking at. And typically when we're looking at AFM images and trying to use them to analyze uh, monolayers, one of the things we look at is something called root mean square roughness, which is basically the overall roughness uh, for the AFM image. It's kind of the standard deviation of all the heights and all the depths that you have in an image. Remember this is topography, so we're looking at Z data points versus an XY data point. So you're looking at the standard deviation of all the Zs. <coughs> this particular image here had an RMS roughness of 0.211 nanometers, which is actually kind of high. If this were a clean silicon surface, that roughness would be 0.02 nanometers instead of 0.2. But the higher RMS or GAN actually comes from the fact that it has a lot of different surface features on it. So what looks like lines across the surface, those are known as step features. And then what looks like holes, little black spots, those really are holes. They're called lattice dislocations. And the lattice dislocations are really what's going to cause changes in initial RMS roughness. So the more holes you have, the greater your RMS value is going to wind up being. So whenever I show you some of the other pictures, I always try to pick a portion of the surface that did not have a lot of those lattice dislocations present. <coughs> So let's talk a little bit about the deposition procedure. Monolayer, uh, depositing a monolayer is actually pretty simple. Uh, all you have to do is basically make a fairly dilute solution, usually around a millimolar or less works, of your SAM molecule in an appropriate solvent. And then you allow your prepared wafers to soak in solution. I mean, this is the beauty of self-assembly. It does all the hard stuff for you. I actually think cleaning the wafers is way more involved and takes more time and consideration than actually depositing the monolayer. So in this picture here, I have a proposed mechanism for the assembly of an OTS, that was the long carbon chain filing, uh, deposited from a dry solvent solution. And this is showing you a silicon surface in this example. So if you look here, what we have are water molecules. Now I just said that we're depositing it from a dry solvent solution. However, you're never going to get rid of all the water. And since the cleaned semiconductor surface is very hydrophilic, that water is going to be hanging out around the surface. The OTS molecules are going to migrate down to the surface. And actually, with what little water is present, <coughs> uh, it's going to hydrolyze the OTS. So OTS is trichlorophyllene at the end group. So when it hydrolyzes, you essentially kick off an HCl. And then, <coughs> then what's going to happen is the 
molecule will then covalently attach to the surface through a dehydration reaction. So now we're going to kick off another water. <coughs> Further dehydration reactions are going to cause silicon oxygen silicon crosslinks between the adjacent OTS molecules. And this is going to further stabilize your monolayer. So down here, this is our siloxane bond that has formed to the surface. That's the silicon oxygen bond. Then over here, we have siloxane crosslinks, if you will, between adjacent molecules of the monolayer. So this is part of what makes uh, silane so stable uh, once they have formed. You've got that covalent bond to the surface, and then you have crosslinking between the molecules. So here I present for you a time study series of the growth of an ultra-smooth OTS monolayer. These AFM images are basically showing that growth occurs by island formation. So you're going to have small OTS patches that are evenly scattered across the GAN surface. Sorry, I switched back to gallium nitride. This is not silicon. <coughs> As time progresses, the OTS is going to continue to populate the surface, and the islands are going to get bigger and bigger until they coalesce into a continuous monolayer. So what you see here is a series of AFM images demonstrating this island growth behavior over time. As time goes on and the monolayer grows, the RMS roughness, that surface roughness, increases. But then when the sand becomes more continuous and it's fully covering the surface, the RMS roughness goes down. Additionally, if we look at water contact angles, since this is OTS, which is very hydrophobic, as time goes on, you see a drastic increase in the contact angle. So remember, we're starting out with a contact angle of less than 10 degrees. If you look here, after an hour in solution, the contact angle has gone up uh, between about 80 and 90 degrees, and surface roughness is 0.152 nanometers. Continuing to let time go on, contact angle goes up to 102 degrees, and roughness has increased to 0.24 nanometers. Then as the monolayer becomes more continuous, here I'll go to the final image, contact angle is 117 degrees, it's very hydrophobic. But the RMS roughness went down to 0.12 nanometers. So this is an ultra smooth, compact OTS monolayer. The next image series I have for you is uh, Aptis on GAN. And the growth pro process for an Aptis monolayer is actually very similar to what we saw with the OTS monolayer where you're going to have island growth formation uh, that eventually coalesces into a continuous film. Aptis actually grows more rapidly than OTS. And the RMS roughness still increases and then decreases as time has gone on. We also see an increase in contact angle, but it's not as significant as with the OTS. And this is due to the fact that OTS has that very hydrophobic carbon chain, but Aptis has a terminal amine group. And some of those amines are protonated. So the contact angle, it's still what we would consider hydrophilic, but it is more hydrophobic than the initial contact angle. So we've gone from about 10 degrees into the 60s, 70s, and low 80 degrees. This is a cross-sectional AFM uh, analysis of a partial OTS monolayer. This type of analysis allows you to measure heights and depths of features on the sample. So here I'm trying to measure the height of the islands. Now OTS has a theoretical thickness of 2.6 nanometers, but this assumes that the carbon chains are standing straight up on the surface. You can see <coughs> I'm getting measurements less than a nanometer. And this is going to be due to one of two things. Number one, the OTS chains are probably not standing straight up. 
And number two, you know, the AFM tip is kind of big and fat when compared to the size of the OTS islands. So the tip might not be able to fit fully in between and get down to touch to reach the surface. So that's two reasons why the height is appearing less than what's expected. Now there is another technique that you could use to measure thickness of a monolayer, and that's ellipsometry. Uh, but ellipsometry is a reflective technique. And the problem is, is it doesn't work on gallium nitride because gallium nitride is transparent. Uh, it does, however, work on silicon. And when doing ellipsometry measurements for aptus and OTS, uh, I got about 0.7 nanometers for aptus and 2.4 nanometers for OTS, which is about what the theoretical thickness, the expected thickness is. Next up, I have a little bit of XPS data for you. So I mentioned that the technique can tell you what element and which orbital the electrons come from. It can also tell you percent concentration for these elements. So here I have what are called region scans, looking at a particular orbital. And I'm showing you the gallium 3P region, which actually overlaps the silicon 2P region. So this is the image that's in the lower right that I'm talking about, gallium 3P, silicon 2P. I also have in the upper left the gallium 2P <coughs> region scan. And what you can see in these scans is an actual attenuation or loss of gallium signal after the monolayer has grown. And the reason the signal attenuates is if you remember, I said that XPS is sensitive to the topmost few nanometers of the surface. So when you're growing this monolayer, you're actually going to start sensing less of the gallium underneath. And that's what causes the drop in signal. So the green line is showing you the fully cleaned gallium signal uh, for clean gallium nitride. And then the red line and the blue line are showing you <coughs> the signal after an aptus or OTS monolayer has grown. If we look at the gallium 3P signal, <coughs> we also see this attenuation. So again, red is showing you Piranha Clean GAN, and green is showing you aptus. But in addition, what happened is we got a little shoulder, a little pop-up of a silicon 2P peak. And this is because the aptus molecule, it's a silane, it has silicon, whereas the original gallium nitride had none. So we've got this unique element in the monolayer that is now showing up in XPS. If you were scanning OTS on aptus or on silicon, you wouldn't be able to see this because silicon is already present in the surface. So what you would do is you would look at things like changes in the rate ratio of the amount of carbon versus the amount of silicon. In the case of aptus, uh, you can actually look at the nitrogen signal. You would look for a nitrogen 1F peak because the original silicon surface does not have any nitrogen in it. That element is unique to the monolayer. So at this time, let's take a little break and answer some couple of questions you may have. Uh, Sam, are you there? Uh, yes, we have a few questions. And one question that I have from the audience is that, is XPS similar to XRD? And I'm not sure what XRD is. Have you heard of it? Yes, XRD is powder diffraction. Um, they're not exactly similar. They're showing you. Uh, some similar information. So X-ray diffraction is more going to tell you things like structure, uh, whereas XPS is really giving you quantitative uh, component analysis. Okay. Uh, and that question was from uh, Jason. I hope uh, he got his answer. If not, you can um, send a text and I will relate that to um, Christina. OK, uh, another question that we have. Uh, 
what are the key measures used to characterize uh, self-assembled monolayer? Uh, for example, do you measure surface roughness or layer thickness or what? You're kind of going to try to do all of the above. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at AFM, you are looking at changes in surface roughness. And it really only helps to do that if you're doing uh, just like what I showed where you have a time study. Um, for surface thickness, that's where ellipsometry is very helpful. Uh, but I told you, uh, as I mentioned in the talk, for gallium nitride, uh, it's transparent. So you can't perform ellipsometry. Uh, what ellipsometry is, so it's a reflective technique. You shine polarized uh, laser light onto the surface. And then it reflects off the surface. It bounces off the surface and changes polarization based on what's on the surface, what that layer's refractive index is. Uh, and you can backtrack out surface thickness. The problem with gallium nitride is the laser goes through the monolayer and then goes through the gallium nitride. So you can't get good measurements using that technique. But certainly for something like silicon, you can do ellipsometry. Then lastly, when it comes to XPS, you're going to be looking at one of two things. One, if your monolayer has unique elements that are not present in the, surf in the original surface, that's a pretty uh, definitive answer of if you have something grown on your surface. If you don't have unique elements, then you're going to be looking for things like signal attenuation of the underlying surface. And you're also going to be looking for changes in percent concentrations, particularly looking at a ratio. So for example, if you have aptus on silicon, you want to look at the, you want to look at the appearance of a nitrogen signal, signal. And then you're going to look at the ratio of nitrogen to, sig to silicon, as well as the ratio of carbon to silicon. So both of those ratios should go up as the monolayer has been deposited on the surface. OK. And the last question for <laughs> this uh, question and answer part. Um, can a self-assembled monolayer be deposited onto a nanostructure like carbon nanotubes? Uh, absolutely it can. Now, carbon nanotubes, I'm not sure if they're going to form a full monolayer. Uh, but carbon nanotubes certainly can be functionalized. And it's a similar self-assembly like what you see with monolayers. But as for other nanostructures, the classic example I can give you is a gold nanoparticle. So thiols are selective for gold. And you can form, you know, the gold nanoparticle is a little sphere. So you essentially form a monolayer shell around the particle. Now, depending on the size of the particle, the number of surface atoms you have might depend on how compact the layer is around it. That's what I'm saying for carbon nanotubes. I don't know if you form a continuous monolayer, but you certainly can functionalize uh, nanostructures. It really depends on the monolayer molecule versus the surface of the structure. <clears throat> okay. Uh, okay. So um, that. Okay. Uh, you can go ahead. We have one more question, but I uh, save it for the end of your presentation for the sake of time. You can go on now. Okay. Um, so let's shift gears a little bit and start talking about some bio applications for these monolayers. So uh, particularly, I'm going to start looking at aptus, because aptus is a very useful, uh, very useful molecule. So some of the aptus amines are going to be protonated, which means you're going to positively charge your surface. And we can exploit that. Uh, in particular, we can immobilize something like DNA, which is <coughs> which is negatively charged, we can immobilize it on the positively charged aptus surface. So in this example that I have for you here, what the group did was they immobilized single-stranded DNA onto the aptus. And then they took the complementary strand and added a fluorophore to it. Then they allowed the complement 
to hybridize, and this caused the surface to then be to then fluoresce. So the image that you're seeing here, it, the bright spots are fluorescing areas where DNA has been immobilized and hybridized onto aptus. And this type of monolayer attachment and immobilization can be used for something like making test pad sites on a microarray for disease detection. Now you don't only have to work with strands of DNA. You can actually immobilize what's known as DNA origami onto the surface. DNA origami, uh, the technique can be used to make wonderful little nanostructures. So that the term origami is really coming from paper origami, you know, the art of paper folding, uh, where just like you would fold the paper into desired shapes, you're going to fold your DNA into desired shapes. What you do is you take a chain of DNA and you sequence, it's a single strand of DNA, and you sequence shorter complementary strands that are going to act as staples that force the chain to bend and kink in specific locations. So this is uh, an example of something that's done quite frequently in the Lieberman group. That's the research group I work in at Notre Dame. And what they've done is they've made 70 nanometer by 90 nanometer DNA rectangles. And they're about 2 nanometers high. And um, again, it's going to be attracted to the positively charged aptus surface. You can also use another filing, which is called TMAC, that's represented right here. And it's very similar to aptus in that it has a positively charged surface. You can take this a step further. And you can bind a gold nanoparticle to the little DNA origami rectangle. And then you can use this for nanoelectronics because some, suddenly you have, you have something that's going to be carrying a charge, deposit, I'm sorry, carrying a current deposited onto the surface. So you can actually make patterned aptus monolayers uh, to make little nano circuits. What this slide is showing you is actually a hybrid nanofabrication technique. And by hybrid, I mean it's combining uh, top-down lithography with bottom-up uh, monolayer uh, formation. So this is going to make lines of gold nanoparticle-bound DNA origami on aptus, little nano circuits. <coughs> what was done here? is EBL, or electron beam lithography, was used to write lines in polymethyl methacrylate uh, resist, which is a type of EBL resist. After the lines have been patterned uh, into the PMMA, you can then deposit your self-assembled monolayer, your aptus or your TMAC, into the trenches of the lines. Then you perform what's known as a liftoff technique. This removes the PMMA, leaving pattern lines of aptus. And on top of that, you bind your DNA with the gold nanoparticle. Next up, I'm going to talk about using hemp structures for biosensor applications. Hemp stands for high electron mobility transistor. And the hemp comes from two different band gap semiconductors that get sandwiched together. And at the interface, electrons are going to get confined. And they're confined in an area known as a two-dimensional electron gap, or 2-deg. The size of the 2-deg is very sensitive to the charges at the surface. And by size, I really mean the number of electrons that are trapped there. So you get a change in electrical properties based on different charges you have at the surface. And this is the basis for making a sensor. <clears throat> so once again, an aptus monolayer is very useful. We can put the aptus monolayer on one of these sandwiched semiconductor structures. And then we can do some additional chemistry on that terminal amine by reacting it with an aldehyde. 
And that's either going to form a shift base, that's the end double bond carbon that you see here, or you can do a full reductive amination where you reduce that to a single bond. With this additional chemistry, <coughs> you can anchor ion capturing molecules to the aptus monolayer. So here I have two examples. <coughs> Uh, one is a crown ether. In particular, it's 15 crown 5, which is selective for sodium ions. So this crown ether has this nice oxygen rich ring, and the oxygen is going to have a lot of, they each have uh, lone pairs of electrons. Electrons have a negative charge, so that attracts the cation into the center of the crown. Then over here, I have what's known as a DPA ligand, or dipicolelamine ligand. DPA can coordinate to zinc, and the zinc has a positive charge on it, so the assembly becomes an anion sensor. So you can bind things like phosphate ions, or once again, you can, bi you can bind DNA. Now, this is just a quick uh, AFM image, again, showing that DNA origami, only this time it's bound to the zinc DPA aptus uh, aptus modified algan surface. <coughs> now it's not quite a functioning device yet. If you're going to make it a hemp structure, it actually needs to be a transistor, which means you need to put down metal contacts onto the surface that will serve as the source and drain of the transistor. So you'll deposit your metal uh, contacts using lithography techniques. Then you're going to functionalize the gate region with aptus. Then you're going to do your aptus modifications, for example, with the crown or with DTA. And then finally, you'll, me you'll measure sensor function. And that involves looking at uh, current voltage curves or IV curve characteristics uh, when you before and after you've exposed the material to your target ions. <coughs> so here I have a literature example uh, where the authors did something similar to what I proposed. Uh, only here they made a sensor for enzymes in particular. They were able to immobilize penicillinase to an aptus modified algan gan hemp structure. So they did a similar uh, reductive amination to bind an anchor that will bind the enzyme. <coughs> and they created a functioning hemp which was able to detect changes in voltage with changes in concentration of the enzyme. They also attached the fluorophore to the enzyme and were able to get uh, the surface to once again fluoresce uh, with immobilization of the enzyme. But now they could electrically detect the presence of the enzyme. <coughs> so silanes on oxides are actually not the only monolayer uh, surface combination that you can use. The last example I have for you is actually showing a functioning hemp structure, so functioning sensor, but now they're using thiol on gold um, SAM surface combination. What they did here was they deposited a thin layer of gold on top of the algangan hemp structure, then they added a thiol molecule that had a tail which was able to immobilize a PSA antibody. This antibody is actually a prostate cancer marker, so again, this is a type of disease detection we're looking at. The hemp device was actually able to detect changes in current with changes in concentration of the antibody. So even though my talk is focusing on uh, silanes, I wanted to show you a different example. It's not the only thing you can do. So with that, I'd like to wrap things up for you. I hope I gave you a nice little overview of working with silanes on oxide surfaces. So I reviewed things like sample prep and deposition. I spoke about analysis techniques. 
And then I went over some bio applications of silanes, including doing additional chemistry techniques uh, and using hemp structures to actually make sensing devices. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for joining me and giving me your time. I'd also like to thank our hosts. Of course, I need to give a big thank you to Dr. Maria Lieberman, my PhD advisor, and the past and present members of the Lieberman group, group including Dr. Bo Gao, Dr. Valerie Goss, and Dr. Kyung Nan Kim, who were all very instrumental in the DNA origami work. I'd also like to thank Dr. Huili Grace Singh from the Electrical Engineering Department. She provided me with the gallium nitride and the aluminum gallium nitride structures. And I would like to thank the University of Notre Dame for giving me my wonderful research opportunity and opportunity to do a PhD. So all of the non-referenced work that's in this presentation was work that was done in the Department of Chemistry at Notre Dame. So once again, thank you very much. Um, we've come to our final very question well. break here. But before Sam asks the first question, I want to take a moment and ask that whether you're joining us live or watching the recorded version of this webinar, please take one minute to help us build a better webinar and provide your feedback and suggestions on our survey. I'll launch the survey and then leave it up while Sam moves on to the first question. Sam? Uh, okay, we have a question. Um, the question is, what's the benefit of using self-assembly over Langmuir Blodre technique? Uh, the Langmuir Blodre technique is actually a type of self-assembly. Um, that's the technique where you have a solution and, and you put your put your surface into the solution and then slowly drag it out so that as you drag it out you form the monolayer across the surface. Um, I would actually say that my method, which is more of an immersion method where you let the sample soak is a little bit easier, but really they're kind of they're very similar. I, I think just physically performing it one might be easier over the other. I'm sure there are certain monolayer molecules that might lend to the langmuir blodgett technique uh, more easy. OK. And uh, another question is that is uh, uh, SAMS biocompatible? Uh, yes. And no, it depends on what the molecule is. So none of the monolayers I oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. all of the monolayers I'm proposing, I'm really doing tests uh, out of not in vivo, they're ex vivo, they're out of the body. Uh, certainly people are doing studies to look for sensors that could be placed in the body to detect changes. Uh, but they are uh, stable in aqueous solution, so most uh, biological tests are going to require that aqueous environment. And they are stable in aqueous environments. Uh, but as far as biocompatible, can you insert them into the body, I really can't answer that at this time. But I'm sure there are because I know people are looking at down that route. Uh, gallium nitride, I will tell you, is biocompatible. The material itself is biocompatible. Okay, thank you. And uh, I believe this is the last question. Uh, you mentioned about the importance of cleanliness and surface preparation. Uh, what about the solution of SAM itself? Um, for example, is purity important? Yes, purity is very important. Uh, number one, you don't want anything that's going anything in the solution that's going to compete with monolayer formation. And number two, you don't want anything in the solution that's going to contaminate your surface. Contamination is actually a big problem uh, in nanotechnology and with monolayer formation. A lot of my monolayers, you know, they're 
out of pure formed in pure solvents. And anything that uses water, I always use um, 18 mega ohm. That's the high resistivity, ultra pure water, uh, particularly because I'm working with semiconductors. You know, semiconductors are notorious for attracting contamination. So yes, you absolutely need to keep an eye on purity and be very careful with how you're making your um, how you're making your solutions. In the AFM, AFM is actually a great tool to tell you if you've got. Um, <laughs> this is not a very scientific trap in your uh, in your solutions because you will get uh, particles all over your substrate if it's not a clean solution. Uh, okay, and I guess we got. Um more questions. Just following up on this question, so can you use um, a self-assembled monolayer as a way of separating the compounds? Uh, you know, if you're using like the modified monolayers where you can uh, attract and bind targets, you might be able to separate them out of a solution. However, the concentrations are very minimal. So in like a I'm trying to remember the numbers here, on a one centimeter squared semiconductor chip, if you have a monolayer, you're only dealing with something it's like ten to the it's either ten to the twelfth or ten to the fifteenth atoms across the surface. So Yes, you might be able to pull things out of solution, binding it to the surface, but you're not pulling things out in any great quantity. Mm -hmm. um, that reminds me of uh, surfactants or soap, regular soap. Um, they are not probably categorized as monolayers, but something like the way that uh, soap acts to remove oil and dirt from um, hand, for example, when you wash your hands. Well, soap, uh, the concentration numbers that we're talking about is much greater than what would be on a monolayer. But soap also, it works a little bit differently because soap, um, you know, it forms an encapsulation around the dirt and that's how it pulls it away. Uh, so it's a little, yes, I guess you could say it's a, it's Similar, but in terms of the amount, soap is so much higher. The amount of soap molecules is so much higher than monolayer molecules on a surface. Okay, and um, I think the last question is: um, Can all monolayers be thiolated? Uh, for example, if um, this question is from Jason. If he is making a monolayer with magnesium oxide, magnesium and oxygen, uh, I believe, uh, can he thiolate them? No. Or only so gold can be thiolated. Um, I don't know if only gold can be thiolated, but oxides cannot. Uh, the thiol is not selective for the oxide. However, you can put a thin layer of gold on top of the oxide and then thiolate that gold. So you'll note that, that last example I gave you with the thiol, you cannot form a, a you, you won't form a monolayer with a thiol on the oxide layer on algan. So they put down that thin layer of gold. I think that the gold layer was something like two nanometers. And then they put um, then they put the thiol on top of the gold. When you're working with the hemp structures, you actually you actually have to be very careful with how thick any kind of layer, like a gold layer, on the surface is, because the thicker it gets, the more, the harder it is to cause changes in the two deg, because then the two deg will be further away from the topmost surface. Uh, okay. Uh, so with that, I believe. Uh, there is no more question, uh, and so thank you very much, Christina. Thank you.
Hi, Hagrid, over. Uh, yep. To access the recording, the slides, and um, other information for this webinar, please visit nanoforme.org slash webinars.php. We have um, other information regarding uh, certificate of participation. If you attended the live version of this 1.5 uh, hour webinar and would like a certificate of participation, please uh, email S. I mean um, S. Barger at engr.psu.edu. We have some upcoming events: uh, June 17th, graphene and other 2D electronic systems; August 10th through 13th, nanotechnology course resources too. And November 17th through 19th, hands-on introduction to nanotechnology for educators workshop. We would like to thank our guests, Sam Agdasi and Christina Aricio, for joining us today. And a special thanks to our audience. Thank you for attending. This concludes our webinar.